In chapter 1.3, we're going to be continuing to look at functions and their graphs. So first, let's get into increasing, decreasing, and constant functions. So for increasing functions, we say that a function is increasing on an interval if it's rising from left to right on the interval. So you can see in this little picture down here, uh, if we scan it left to right, then it is rising up. So essentially what this means as the x values are getting larger, the function values, which are the y values, are also getting larger. So that is an increasing function. For a decreasing function, a function is decreasing on an interval if it's falling from left to right. So this time we're scanning left to right, and you can see that the function is falling. So that means it's decreasing on this interval. So what this means is that as the x values get larger, the function values or the y values are getting smaller. And lastly, we have these constant functions. So a, a function is constant on an interval if it is a horizontal line. So this one's pretty easy to tell if it's constant. You just look for a horizontal line. And this means that the function values are going to be the same over that whole entire interval. So the y values are going to be constant. Okay, and just a little uh, important note down here. When we're going to be determining when a function is increasing, decreasing, or constant, we're always going to scan it left to right. So scanning it left to right, uh, the intervals are going to be the x values. So they're going to be x values, and we're going to write them in interval notation. And if there's more than one interval for, one of, for increasing, decreasing, or constant, we're going to write them both, and we're going to join them together using that union symbol, that, that u. And for interval notation, we're always going to use parentheses. No brackets for, for these intervals. Yeah, let's do a couple examples here. So let's state the intervals in which each given uh, function is increasing, decreasing, or constant. So we have this, we have this graph right here. So scanning it left to right, we can see that it's going to negative infinity in the x direction. So uh, scanning it left to right, we see that it is falling. So it's falling from here to here. So that means it's going to be decreasing on the interval. And then once we get to here, it's going to start rising, which means it's increasing. And then it's going to be falling again, so it's decreasing. So writing out for increasing. So increasing, we said it was increasing here. So it's really important to make sure you're scanning left to right. So that's increasing because as the x values are getting bigger, the y values are also getting bigger. So that's going to be increasing from 0 to 2. Okay, remember those are the x values that we plop down. That's not an x, y coordinate. That is an interval 0 to 2. And for decreasing, we said it's decreasing from here to here and then here to here because it was falling left to right. So that's going to be from negative infinity because of the arrow to 0 union 2 to infinity because of the other arrow on the end. So we join the intervals with the union, and that is for uh, the interval for when it's decreasing. And this is, there's no horizontal line, so this is going to be never constant. Okay, let's do another one. So we have this graph right here. So scanning it left to right, it looks like it's constant here, and then it's increasing, and then it's still increasing, and then it is constant. So let's write this out, start with increasing again. So for increasing, we said it was increasing from here to here and then here to here. That's We can just count that in one interval. So that's gonna be from negative two to four. And it is never decreasing. So we said it was constant right here and right here. So that's going to be negative infinity to negative 2. So once again, that's because of the arrows to negative infinity. And then we have to join. We have another interval, so we have to join it with the u for union. 
So union, and then four to infinity. Oops, sorry, that's gonna be for constant, not decreasing. And then just like we said a second ago, this is never decreasing. Okay, so for the next thing is relative maxima and relative minima. So the points at which a function changes from increasing to decreasing or decreasing to increasing are gonna be used to help us find the relative max or the relative min, which are gonna be the values uh, on the, for the function. So starting with the relative, uh, relative maximum. So the A at the end, maxima, minima, that's plural. The, the UM at the end is singular. Uh, the relative maximum, a function value f of a is going to be a relative maximum if f of a is slightly larger than the values immediately to its left and to its right. A relative minimum, we're going to say a relative a function value f of a has a relative minimum if f of a is less than the values immediately to the left and to the right. So taking a look at this graph on here, we can see a relative minimum down here at the bottom because it is just less than the value to its left and to its right. And then relative maximum up here, because it is slightly larger than the values to its left and to its right. So it's not, it doesn't have to be the absolute max or min. It doesn't have to be the largest on the graph or the smallest on the graph. It just has to be larger or smaller than the points immediately next to it. So hence the name relative. It's only a maximum or a minimum to that relative location. Another word for these, which I'll write it up here, instead of relative, it's also called local. Okay, let's do some examples for those. So let's use the graphs to find the numbers at which the function has a relative max or min, which is gonna be the, the x value, and then what are the actual max and min, which is the y value. So if it's asking for the relative max or min, that's the y value. If it's asking where, then it's the x value. So taking a look at this graph, we have, let's look at the relative, um, the relative max first. So that's gonna be, a relative max is gonna be when it's changing from increasing to decreasing, or it's larger than the points immediately to its left and to its right. That's gonna be right here. So that's gonna be a relative maximum at an x value at zero, at x equals zero. And the value is the y value, is y equals four. Okay, and then for the relative minimum, put minima, because there's two of them. There's one here and there's one here. So there's gonna be a relative minima at x equals negative three and x equals three. And both values are y equals zero. Okay, so let's do another example here. So B, we have this graph, so let's look at the relative max first. So there's two maximas, there are two maxima, there's gonna be one here and one here, where it's changing from increasing to decreasing. Top, it's kind of like the top of the hill if you want to think of it that way. And the relative maxima are at x equals zero and x equals three. And both values are y equals zero. Okay, and then for the relative minimum, so there's only one of them, so I just put I put minimum instead of minima. So it looks like it's gonna be that point right there where it's changing from decreasing to increasing, so it's like the bottom of a valley. So the relative minimum here is gonna be at x equals, looks like 1.5. And the value is negative five. Okay, so that's pretty much it for relative max and min, just uh, looking using the graph to help us find it. And it's kind of a side note, an endpoint cannot be a relative max or min, because if it's an endpoint, then there's going to be, say it was an endpoint on the right, then that means it wouldn't have a point to its right, so it can't be 
larger or smaller than the point to its right because it doesn't exist. So endpoints cannot be relative max or min. Okay, for the next thing here is the tests of symmetry. So the three types of symmetry here, it's not the only types of symmetry, the three main ones. We have symmetry with respect to the y-axis. So that means it's a mirror image of itself over the y-axis. If that's the case, then the y for the x value being positive x and negative x, they'll have the same y value. So if we had two and negative two, they would both have the same y value. The other one is x-axis symmetry, which means if we had the same x values, it would give us a positive and negative y value. And then the other one is respect to the origin. What that means is a 180 degree rotation. That means if we have the point x and y, then the point negative x and negative y are also on the graph. Okay, so the ones that we're really going to be uh, focusing on here are going to be the y-axis symmetry and the origin symmetry. Not really going to be focusing on the x-axis symmetry, um, mainly because we're going to be dealing with functions a lot, and if it has x-axis symmetry, it's not a function because it fails the vertical line test. Okay, so let's get it started with the uh, y-axis symmetry. If a function is symmetric with respect to the y-axis, we call those even functions. And that means if a point x, y is on the graph, then the point negative x, comma, y is also on the graph. So what that means is if we evaluate f of negative x, so we plug in negative x into all the x's, it ends up simplifying to be the original f of x. So let's see what happens here. Let's show that f of x equals x squared is an even function. So we're going to do, we're going to evaluate f of negative x, and we're gonna show that that equals f of x. So we have to plug in a negative x, so instead of x squared, it's negative x squared. Negative x to an even exponent, the negative cancels, drop the parentheses, so that just actually equals positive x squared, which equals, the original, that was the original function that we started with. So since f of negative x equals f of x, it is an even function, so y-axis symmetry. And we actually know what this, we can graph this and we can see what it looks like here, so let's graph it. So I'll do this by plotting some points, plug in a negative two, negative two squared is four, so negative two comma four. Plug in a negative one, we get one, so negative one comma one. 0, 0, 1, 1, and we would get 2, 4. So I just did that by plot plugging in x values, getting out their y values. So it would look something like this. This is x of x equals x squared. So you can see how it does have the uh, symmetry over the y-axis, mirror image of itself over the y-axis. So next for the origin symmetry. So if a, fu if a function has is, is as a graph is symmetric with respect to the origin. Once again, that means it is a 180 degree rotation of itself. We call these odd functions. So I'll, I'll explain why we call them even and odd functions in a second. So this means that if the point x, y is on the graph, then the point negative x, negative y is also on the graph. So this means if we plugged in negative x into x, so f of negative x, that's gonna equal the negative version of our function. The hint here is when we're doing this, which we'll see in a second, is factor out a negative one after you plug in negative x to see if it equals negative f of x. Okay, let's do an example here. So let's show that f of x equals x cubed is an odd function. So that means we need to plug in a negative x. So plugging in a negative x, that's gonna give us negative x cubed negative x to an odd power, you can drop the parentheses and it's going to remain negative. So it's going to be negative x cubed, which we can see that this does equal negative f of x, the negative version of our original. So since f of negative x equals negative f of x, it is an odd function, which means origin symmetry. So plugging in some points here, and also just, I also just know what it looks like. Uh, it's going to look something like this. Oops, got to redo those dots. OK, 
Okay, so it'll look something like this. This is f of x equals x cubed. So you can see that if you turned your screen upside down, it would look exactly the same, which means it's an odd function, which means it has origin symmetry, which means it is a 180 degree rotation of itself. So you can see that the there's a point one comma one on this graph, which means there's also the point negative one comma negative one on the graph, which there is. Okay, so let's determine whether each of the following functions is odd, even, or neither. And then we'll determine if it, what kind of uh, symmetry it has. So first one, we have f of x equals x cubed minus 6x. So for all of these, we have to start by plugging in a negative x. So evaluate f of negative x, we get negative x cubed minus 6 times negative x. So negative x to an odd power, that's going to be, drop the parentheses, negative x cubed, negative 6 times negative x is plus 6x. So this does not equal f of x, right? That does not equal what we started with. So we tr what we want to do now is try to factor out a negative 1. So if we factor out a negative 1, that's going to be x cubed minus 6x. That's left over because we factored out a negative. And now we compare this with the, what we started with. What we started with was x cubed minus 6x. So we can clearly see here that this does now equal negative f of x. So since this equals negative f of x, that means it is an odd function. So it has origin symmetry. Okay, next one, g of x equals x to the fourth minus 2x squared. So once again, we start the same way. We plug in a negative x and evaluate. So that's going to be negative x to the fourth minus 2 times negative x squared. So negative x to the fourth, that's an even power. The negatives are going to cancel. So it's x to the fourth. Uh, negative x squared, negatives are going to cancel. So it's just minus 2 times positive x squared. Okay, so comparing this to, be, to the beginning, this actually equals g of x. That actually equals what we started with. So since that equals what we started with, that means it is a uh, an even function. So it has y-axis symmetry. Okay, and the next one here we have h of x is x squared plus 2x plus 1. So we're going to evaluate h of negative x. So that's going to be negative x squared plus 2 times negative x plus 1. Negative x squared, that's just positive x squared. And then minus 2x because of the negative plus 1. Then we check, does it equal the original here? It does not. This is not the same thing as the original, what we started with. So then we try to factor out a negative 1. When we factor out a negative 1, we're left with negative x squared plus 2x minus 1. And then you check to see the inside the parentheses if that equals what we started with. It does not. So that does not equal negative h of x either. So since it does not equal either of those, then there is neither of those symmetries. Okay, so there is a shortcut here. So coming back to why they're called even and odd. So if the function is a polynomial with only even exponents, with or without the constant term, so if it's only even exponents, then the function is an even function, so y-axis symmetry. If the function only contains odd exponents without the constant, then the function is an odd function. If it has a mix of even and odd exponents, then the function has neither y-axis nor origin symmetry. So for the constant part, the reason why the constant matters, a constant can be thought of as an even exponent because we can give it a variable and give it an exponent of zero because anything to the zero is one. So zero would be considered an even number. So a constant is thought of as an even term. Okay, so definitely use that shortcut if you can. Uh, let's just take a look up here real quick. So in this example C, we saw that it had a mix of even and odd exponents. We had an exponent of two, one, and then a constant. So two, one, and zero mix of even and odd, so that had neither symmetry. 
For part b here, we see that we had only even exponents of 2 and 4. Since they were even, it was an even function, so y-axis symmetry. And then for a, we had exponents of 3 and 1. Those are odd, so we knew it was an odd function. So definitely a nice shortcut here. Okay, for the next thing. So for piecewise functions, so a, a function that is defined by two or more equations over a specified domain is called a piecewise function. So it's going to be a function composed of multiple functions, but those multiple functions are going to be over different domains. So they're going to be over different x values. So to evaluate a piecewise function at a certain interval, or a certain value rather, we have to figure out what function to use based on which domain the value falls in. And if we we're going to be graphing piecewise functions, we would graph each function only on their corresponding domains. So let's do this example here. So this is what it would look like. We have f of x equals, and then we have the, the squiggly bracket, that brace. It equals either x plus 2 or it equals 4. It equals x plus 2 when x is less than or equal to 1, and it equals 4 when x is greater than 1. So it equals this first one on that domain and it equals the second one on this domain. Okay, so if we want to, uh, we're going to graph this also. So if we want to evaluate f of negative 1, we have to see which one, which domain the negative 1 falls within. Negative 1 is, we have to determine whether or not, whether it's either less than or equal to 1 or greater than 1. So negative 1 is our x value, which in this case is less than or equal to 1. So that means we use the first one. Okay, so we're using x plus 2. So evaluating f of negative 1, we plug it in. That's negative 1 plus 2, which is just positive 1. So that means f of negative 1 equals 1. Next one, evaluate f of 5. So now we have to see what domain 5 falls within. It, we have to determine if it's either less than or equal to 1 or greater than 1. It's clearly greater than 1. So that means we use f of x equals 4 because that's the function that's over that domain. So plugging this in, f of 5. f of 5 is just going to be equal to 4. It's going to be equal to 4 for any value actually for that domain. So graphing this, let's graph the x greater than 1 first. So if x is greater than 1, it said it was equal to 4. That's just going to be a straight line. Oh, it's going to be constant at 4. So it's also not or equal to, it's just greater than. So we go to 1 for the domain on the x values. And I'm going to plot an open circle at 4. And then it's going to equal 4 for everything greater than it. Okay, and then for everything less than or equal to 1, it's going to be equal to x plus 2. So we could plug in a number here. If we plugged in 1, if we evaluated f of 1, <clears throat> we would get 1 plus 2 is 3. So it would have a closed circle here because of the or equal to. And we can keep on plotting points here if we wanted. We would find that another point would be here, here, and so on. So I'm just going to... oops. It's going to connect this line, and it'll look something like this. Okay, so this is what the piecewise function would look like. It f of x equals 4 for everything greater than 1, but f of x equals x plus 2 for everything less than or equal to 1. Let's do two more here. So let's use g of x, which is this piecewise function. It equals 6x minus 1 when x is less than or equal to 0. And then it equals 2x plus 3 when x is greater than 0. So let's evaluate these. So let's evaluate g of 0. So we go to that input and we say, is that less than or equal to 0 or is it greater than 0? Well, it's going to be less than or equal to 0 because it's equal to it. So that means we use the first one. So we used g of x equals 6x minus 1 to evaluate. So g of 0 is going to be 6 times 0 minus 1, which gives us g of 0 is negative 1. 
Next, for g of negative 2, so negative 2, we have to determine which one to use. Is it the first one or second one? Negative 2 is also less than or equal to 0. So we're going to be using that first one again. So we're going to plug it in. So a g of negative 2 is 6 times negative 2 minus 1. That's negative 12 minus 1, which is negative 13. So if we were going to graph this, Let's take a look at everything greater than 0 first. So if it was greater than 0, it equals 2x plus 3. So we could plug in values. And if we plugged in values, we would get that it looked like something like this. So greater than 0. Let's plug in a 0 to see where it would be. So if we plugged in a 0 for the second one here, that'd be 2 times 0 plus 3, which would be 3. So that would be up here at 3, but it's not or equal to, so it gets an open circle. And if we plotted a 1, if we plugged in a 1, 2 times 1 plus 3 is 2 plus 3, which is 5. So 5, and then we would connect them, and that would be the first part. And for the second part, for everything less than or equal to 0, so if we plug in a 0 for this first one over here, that's going to be 6 times 0 minus 1, which is negative 1. So that would put us right here. It's a closed circle because it was or equal to. And let's say we plugged in a negative 1. 6 times negative 1 minus 1 is negative 7, which isn't even on the graph. So I'm just going to kind of wing it and do that. Okay, so this would be our piecewise function g of x. Let's do one more. So we have this other function h of x. So h of x, there's three different domains here. It either equals x, if x is less than negative 3. It equals 4, if x equals negative 3. Or it equals negative x plus 2 when x is greater than negative 3. So let's evaluate these. So first one, h of negative 3. So negative 3 is just x equals negative 3. So we have to use the middle one. So we're using h of x equals 4. So that means h of negative 3 is just going to straight up equal 4, and that's it. No x is the plug in. Now if we do h of negative 4, x here, our negative 4 is less than negative 3, so we have to use the first one, which is h of x equals x. So that means h of negative 4 equals, we plug in a negative 4 into x, so we just get negative 4. Next one, we have h of 1. So 1 is greater than negative 3. So that means we use the last one. h of x equals negative x plus 2. So plugging that in, we get h of 1 equals negative 1 plus 2 gives us 1. So h of 1 equals 1. So let's graph this now. So looking at this uh, piecewise, let's deal with x less than negative 3. If x is less than negative 3, it equals x. So I'm going to plug in a negative 3 into that. Go back up here. So I'm talking about this first one right here. So if it's less than negative 3, it equals x. So that means plug in negative 3 into x. That'll just give us negative 3. That'll give us that coordinate right here. If we plug in a negative 4, that would give us negative 4, so right there, and it would just keep on going. So that first part would look like that. That's for x less than negative 3. We had an open circle because it was not or equal to. For the next one, when x is negative 3, it equals 4. So that actually just gives us the coordinate negative 3 comma 4. So that's going to be right here. So it equals 4 at negative 3. And then for everything greater than negative 3, it equals negative x plus 2. So if we plug in a negative 3 into that, that's going to give us negative negative 3 plus 2. 3 plus 2 is 5. So that's going to give us this point up here. And it's an open circle because it's not or equal to. So it's not equal to for that one. And then to see what we do after that, maybe plug in another number. Let's plug in 0 because it's easy. 
plugging in a zero, negative x plus two, zero plus two is two. So that would give us this point right here and connect those. And that would give us this and that is our total graph for h of x. Kind of looks messy, um, but that is piecewise functions. There's different pieces of this function over different domains. So you can see that obviously I didn't go into too much depth with graphing it. Uh, I knew that these were linear equations for most of these, so they were easier to graph. Uh, we just didn't get into graphing too much, so I'm just kind of skipped over it kind of quickly, but at least wanted to show these graphs. Okay, so that is it for 1.3.